What's the worst that could happen on an airplane? Maybe this. There's not enough oxygen to survive up here. A freezing wind of hurricane force is roaring through the cabin. The flight crew call Mayday, but nobody hears. And the airplane is headed for a mountain. It sounds like a nightmare. For everyone aboard Aloha Airlines Flight 243, this is no nightmare. It's reality. Aloha 243, still up. When crash detectives discover what happened, their verdict shakes the airline business. This accident changed aviation history. Some people choose to trespass in that narrow space between life and death. It's a scary place to be. Surfers get there by chasing killer waves. Just occasionally, fate puts ordinary people, not just thrill seekers, into that same deadly zone where life hangs by a thread. On the afternoon of April 28, 1988, it will happen in the sky over Hawaii. At 1 p.m., Aloha Airlines Flight 243 is preparing to depart. A Boeing 737 is on the tarmac at Hilo Airport on Hawaii's Big Island, the southernmost of the Hawaii chain. Flight 243 will be just a 35-minute hop to Honolulu on the island of Oahu. Serving the islands means that Aloha works its airplanes hard. They make short flights, but plenty of them. This airplane has been shuttling between the islands since early morning. It'll be its ninth flight today. For the flight crew, it's a routine they've followed for many years. Aloha, 243. Roger. Captain Bob Schornsteimer has been flying for 11 years with Aloha Airlines. Roger. His Roger. first officer, Mimi Tompkins, is hoping for promotion to captain after almost nine years with Aloha. Did you hear any more about... Uh... <laughs> Each of the flight attendants has a long service record too, but none so long as Clarabel Lansing, known to everyone as just CB. Well, Mr. Kiner, welcome. Always good to see you, CB. You fixed some good weather for us. I've smoothed all the way. You bet. She's been flying for 37 years, since before the days of the first jet airliner. Let me help you with this. Oh, yeah. CB is the boss in the cabin, first flight attendant. Michelle Honda, a 14-year veteran, is number two. Jane Sato Tomita has served 19 years. This is one of the most experienced crews you'll find in an airplane that's been crisscrossing Hawaii's islands safely for 19 years. Circuit breakers. It's made more than 89,000 flights. On this day, only one other 737 in the entire world beats that record. Checked. Passengers have no reason to doubt they're in safe hands. Until one passenger, Gail Yamamoto, sees something that makes her pause. But what is it she's concerned about? And how worried should she be? Do I say something? Patricia Aubrey lives in Hilo, but has an appointment today in Honolulu. At first, she opts for the very front of the airplane, in row one. But somehow she feels uneasy and decides to move further back. She chooses a free seat in row 17. At 1.25, flight 243 is ready for takeoff. This airplane often rattles and shakes on takeoff and landing, but it's something the crew and regular passengers have grown used to. What's there to worry about? Though he's the captain, Bob Schornsteimer has chosen to take charge of radio links with air traffic control. It's Mimi Tompkins who'll fly the plane to Honolulu. 
Most of the flight time is taken up in climbing to their cruising altitude. It'll take 20 minutes to climb to 7,300 meters. For many passengers, soaring high over the Pacific is all part of the daily routine. People like salesman Howard Kitaoka in row five, he makes this trip often. When you've seen the view a hundred times, 35 minutes is precious time to catch up on paperwork. The flight's so short that the attendants serve drinks while they're still climbing. They can move around, but the passengers are still strapped in. It's 1.45. 20 minutes into the flight, the aircraft is at cruising height. Honolulu Center, Aloha 243, leveling off at 240. The crew relax. See, where's that National Weather Service weather station out here? Is that in the old tower? In perfect flying weather, everything is following the familiar pattern. I saw a brilliant flash of light and boom. Everything was going, was being sucked out of the plane. Here's what's happened. An explosive decompression has torn away 35 square meters of fuselage. We were in a tremendous blast of wind. The wind blast was unbelievable. A mass of things just went whoosh out the plane. You know. Hair was up here. Everybody was in their seat, except the stewardesses. I saw the stewardess get smashed down in the, in the aisle. I could see her hair blowing, and I could see blood, but I, that's all I could see of her. Jane Sato Tomita has been struck by debris at row two. Michelle Honda has been thrown to the floor at row 15. There's no sign at all of CB Lansing. I will take control call. I can't only seconds have passed since the explosion. The wind noise makes it impossible for the flight crew to communicate. Now, for the first time, they gain a sense of what's happened. Visible over a mound of tangled debris, there's blue sky where the airplane roof used to be. The first five rows are now completely exposed to the sky on both sides of the plane. The initial threat of being sucked out is past since the airplane's now completely depressurized. But passengers are still in danger. My seatmate was flopping out outside the aircraft because at that point it was just the floor and no walls or seating. And so I grabbed him. The cold and oxygen deprivation are both potentially deadly. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. The passengers don't have any ability to get supplemental oxygen because the critical tubing that feeds that oxygen is now gone. And at 24,000 feet, with very little to breathe up there, the passengers become incapacitated. That's called hypoxia. If you stay up at that altitude for any prolonged period of time, you become more and more physically disabled. With the top of the airplane gone, you now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. High above the Pacific Ocean, an extraordinary drama is unfolding. An explosion at 7,300 meters, aboard a Boeing 737 bound for the Hawaiian island of Oahu, tears 35 square meters of fuselage from the airplane, exposing passengers to the sky. The cabin is depressurized with no emergency oxygen supply. Unless they rapidly reach a lower altitude where they can breathe again, the passengers will die. Captain Bob Schornsteimer takes over command of the aircraft from First Officer Mimi Tompkins. He begins an emergency descent, dropping 1,200 meters per minute, its speed now increasing to more than 500 kilometers an hour. As the aircraft hurtles down, passengers face a new terror. Wreckage blocks their view of the cockpit, and when the airplane split apart, the nose dropped down by around one meter. 
The plane is held together by just the narrow floor beams. The floor was buckling up, and you could tell the plane was bending in the middle. Michelle Honda can't go forward far enough to see whether the pilots are alive or dead. She tries to make contact via the intercom. Can anyone hear me? The wires are severed. As she struggles forward to try to reach the cockpit, she gets asked the one question she can't answer. Do we have a pilot? I don't know. Do we have a pilot? I do not know. Can you fly plane? The terror of those on board can only be imagined as she asks the one question no airplane passenger wants to hear. Michelle Honda was coming up and cupping her hands and yelling in everyone's ear individually, can you fly a plane? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, get out of here. Is the, is the pilot gone too? You know, because you couldn't tell if there was anybody up there. Do you know how to fly a plane? No. First Officer Mimi Tompkins tries to alert air traffic control at Honolulu. Recordings from the cockpit voice recorder, the black box, analyzed later by accident investigators, provide a dramatic record of exactly what took place. The nearest place where they can try to land is the island of Maui. Kahului Airport lies between two volcanic mountains. Between them and safety lies a 3,000 meter high summit. To fly from the location of the explosion to the safety of Kahului Airport, the pilot needs to carefully maneuver, avoiding this high ground. Can the fragile aircraft survive the stresses of turning, or if they ever reach the airport, of landing? And how can those on board survive? Jane Satotomita is barely conscious. Howard Kitaoka clutches her hand. The only faint sign of life is once when Jane squeezes back. I'm not exactly sure she was conscious, but I did manage to squeeze her hand, and she responded by squeezing my hand, and we just held hands. The simple squeeze of the hand at a time like that is very, very emotional. Mimi Tompkins is not getting through to Honolulu air traffic control, so she switches to the frequency for the tower at Maui's Kahului Airport. Maui Tower, Aloha, 243. Maui Tower, Aloha, 243. Aircraft calling tower, say again. Aloha, 243. At 1.48, three minutes after the explosion, the crew make their first voice contact with the ground. Aloha 243, say your position. In the station, in the station. Attention in the station. We have an in-flight emergency. We have a 737, five minutes out, 20 miles. Runway two. Souls on board, crew on board is unknown. It has deep compression problems at this time. Runway two, runway two. Aloha 243. Okay, the equipment is on the field. It's on the way. At 3,000 meters, flying west of the mountain, the pilot slows the aircraft and as gently as possible begins the right-hand turn towards Kahului. Passengers sense that someone must be in control of the aircraft. I've had some training as a pilot, and we were wings level. It wasn't in a dive or a roll, it was wings level. At that moment, I thought, we have a chance. 
Meanwhile, those on the ground are unsure about what kind of crisis they're facing. It's a small airport. An airliner in trouble will test the fire crew's experience. For the air controller, it's hard to hear the airplane at all. Just to verify again, you're breaking up. Your call sign is 243. Is that correct? 4244. Aloha 243! Aloha 243! Aloha 243. Plan straight ahead for runway 02. I'll keep you advised of any wind change. Four minutes after the explosion. At this lower altitude, they're able to remove their oxygen masks. With their speed having dropped to a little over 380 kilometers an hour, the wind noise decreases just enough for them to hear one another. You want me to call for anything else? No. Aloha 243. Looks like we've lost a door. We have a hole in the left side of the aircraft. But the tower can't hear this new information. They've lost contact with the aircraft. Their transmissions aren't being picked up. Aloha 243, you still up? Is this a radio malfunction or something worse? Aloha 243. Hearing nothing from the stricken aircraft, the controller fears the worst. Aloha 243. Aloha 243, still up. Aloha 243, if you still hear, please identify. Affirmative. Aloha 243, Roger. I got your ident straight away. Cleared to land, wind 040 at 20 knots. Communication is restored, but the crew's ordeal is far from over. Cabot, do you hear? Now Mimi Tompkins tries to contact the cabin by intercom, but there's no response. Well, the crew doesn't really know what's going on behind them. The airplane is still flying. The captain now has to maintain his focus on flying that airplane but he doesn't know what real damage exists behind him. Tell him we'll need assistance to evacuate. Right. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Can you hear me on tower frequency? Aloha 243, I hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. We're going to need assistance. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. We'll need assistance with the passengers when we land. Okay, you're going to need an ambulance, is that correct? Affirmative! During the descent, passengers experience moments of pure terror. The plane kept vibrating and shaking, and the luggage racks were falling in, and there was electrical wires flying around, zapping, and, uh, you know, pretty much pandemonium, but it looked like the plane was ripping in half. And suddenly, there's a new problem for the flight crew to handle. Your flight manual reversion! What? The flight control feel like manual reversion! It feels to the pilot as though hydraulic systems, like power steering in an automobile, have now failed. The airframe is under great stress. They need to land as soon as possible. Can we maintain altitude, okay? There are so many thoughts that go through your head. Like, one of my thoughts was, uh, man, don't put this thing in the water. I mean, you have people around you who are hurt, unconscious. I didn't want to have to say, well, I'm going to try to save this guy first or that guy first, or whatever, I, and don't put it on the water. The crew fear that critical wiring and control cables may have been severed. Have any of the airplane's vital parts been damaged? Let's try flying with the gear down. All right, you've got it. There are lights to indicate whether or not the landing gear has safely deployed. The main undercarriage has extended as normal. But the light showing that the nose wheel has extended doesn't come on. The last thing the pilot wanted to see, especially with his airplane in the condition it was in, was that he didn't have a nose gear, because when the nose touched down on the runway, it would have broken the airplane apart therefore breaking probably the fuel tanks apart, which could lead to a very dramatic fire and explosion. A second attempt to extend the landing gear. The nose gear light is still out, but the radio link is so bad, the tower is still trying to assimilate the crisis. Aloha 243. Just to verify, you do need an ambulance, is that correct? 
They still don't understand. Affirmative. Roger, how many do you think are injured? We have no idea. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. Okay, we'll have the ambulance on the way. There's a possibility that we won't have a nose gear. Now, Bob Sean's timer has to make a critical decision. Should he wait for confirmation that the undercarriage is down, or land anyway? The textbook in this case would tell the pilots to overfly the airfield so that the air traffic controllers can look at the landing gear and give them a report whether it's up or down. The pilots would then have to maneuver the airplane all the way around the airfield, come in for an approach, and land. But with an airplane which might break apart at any moment, that's out of the question. Tell them we've got problems. But we're going to land anyway, even without a nose gear. But they should be aware that we don't have a nose gear indication down. Aloha 243, wind now 050. The emergency equipment is in place. OK, be advised, we have no nose gear. We are landing with no nose gear. OK, if you need any other assistance, advise. We'll need all the equipment you've got. Maui is not an ideal place to head for with the damaged airplane. The island's exposed north shore lies directly in the path of the trade winds. I've done that landing a lot of times, and that particular approach corridor is very windy because of the mountain on one side and mountain on the other. So it's a very bumpy approach. But uh, that's basically all we had. Any kind of in-flight turbulence, that would have put great stresses on the front end of the airplane. And there's a high probability that the cockpit would have separated from the rest of the fuselage. Catastrophic loss of the airplane and a loss of life. With the airfield now in sight, Bob Sean's timer has more critical decisions to make. He begins to slow the aircraft for landing. Let's try flaps 15. An airplane's flaps are sliding panels at the back of the wings. To increase lift at low speeds, they need to be extended during takeoff and landing. Is it easier to control with the flaps up? Yeah. Put them back to five. Can you give me a V speed for a flap five landing? No two aircraft landings are the same. Pilots have to factor in many things, the wind speed and direction, passenger and fuel load and the length of the runway before them. Do you want the flaps right down as we land? What? Do you want the flaps right down as we land? Yeah. But after we touch down. OK. A complicated formula provides the VREF, indicating the safe landing speed. Even in a crisis like this, pilots have to reach for the manual. Extending the flaps fully will help act as a brake once they touch down. But to do it earlier could stress the airframe to breaking point. What you have to remember is that the pilots weren't trained to handle a situation like this. With the top of their airplane missing, they became test pilots. The aerodynamic effects of the airplane were drastically different than they were used to. They really had to fly by the seat of their pants. Aloha 243, wind now 050 at 20. V-Ref 40. Using her flight manual, the first officer makes the complicated calculation that will give their correct landing speed. Right. The safe speed for landing, taking into account the length of Kahalui's runway 2, is calculated to be 152 knots, 282 kilometers an hour. As the airplane slows, it becomes much harder to control. And so the pilot has to make another crucial call. Speeding up to keep control means he'll hit the runway faster than he should. He gambles that the higher speed landing is still the best option. Our approach speed, I felt, was hot. I mean, we were coming in hot. I don't know, don't ask me how many miles an hour it was, because I don't know. But from other landings, we were coming in fairly hot. Crash rescue teams prepare themselves for a worst case scenario. At high speed and without the nose gear, a crash landing followed by a catastrophic fuel fire now seems inevitable. 
Under these conditions, the lack of a nose gear could have been a death sentence for everybody aboard this aircraft. A Boeing 737 with 95 people on board has suffered an explosive decompression near the Hawaiian island of Maui. It's still airborne, but only just, with 35 square meters of fuselage missing from the Aloha plane. As they prepare for an emergency landing, warning lights indicate that the forward landing gear has not deployed. If so, the airplane will most likely crash and burn. In the 12 horrifying minutes since the explosion, some passengers are convinced they're not going to make it alive. I thought it was going to go in the water, and uh, I was eaten by sharks. And then we saw the mountain, and I didn't think we were going to make it over it. I just knew we were going to crash into that mountain. And then when we could tell, we could see the airport. And then, you know, then I burned to death because the plane blew up when we, when we hit the runway. Suddenly, the news the pilots have been praying for. The gear is down. Inform call and command, the gear is down. OK, thanks. Aloha 243, just for your information, the gear appears down. The gear appears down. Want me to go to flop 40? Help you? No, on the ground. The crew have had to make life or death decisions. In the next few seconds, they'll find out whether they're the right ones. Michelle Honda cradles her injured colleague as the critical moment approaches. Passengers comfort one another in what may be their last moments alive. A woman that was sitting next to me and her husband, he was on the other side in the next row up. And she was next to me and they were reaching their hands out and they were trying to touch fingers to say goodbye. I was, I was a really touching moment for me. It was when I really knew I was going to die because they were saying goodbye to each other. What gave me the most comfort was knowing that my wife and my kids knew what I felt. That was great comfort. I, I didn't need to tell them anything further, that I love you or, you know, I worry about you, because I felt that I had already said that. Though the forward undercarriage has extended, the crew still can't be certain whether it is locked in place or whether it'll collapse on landing. If it doesn't hold firm, 40,000 kilos of airplane traveling at close to 320 kilometers an hour will smash nose down onto the tarmac. Aloha 243, just shut it down where you are. Okay. Everything's fine. The gear did it. The fire trucks are on the way. Okay. Shut it down. Shut it down? 